Sabu will uh, give the overall objectives and present about RSS DI. And then Dr. Namrata Sharma will talk about AIS and their initiatives. Then you will start. We are live now, Doctor. Oh, we are live now? Yes, Doctor. Okay. So good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to this uh, very important workshop, uh, first of its kind initiative by the uh, RSSDI, the Diabetes Society of India, the All India Ophthalmological Society and Vitro Society of India for a joint workshop on diabetic retinopathy. So this is uh, meant as a collaborative initiative for both ophthalmologists and diabetologists because we all feel that uh, working together, we will be able to solve the problem of diabetic retinopathy uh, more than trying to tackle it individually. We are extremely grateful to have uh, uh, experts on this uh, session today, mainly the branch, brainchild of Dr. Padmaja Kumari Rani, uh, who is my colleague at LB Prasad Eye Institute. Uh, joining us today, we have the president of uh, RSSDI, Dr. Banshi Sabu, uh, and also the honorary secretary of uh, RSSDI, Dr. Sanjay Agarwal. And uh, we have representing AIOS, uh, uh, Dr. Namrata Sharma, honorary secretary of AIOS. Um, I would now request uh, our esteemed president of Vitoretna Society of India, Dr. Sobit Chavla, to give a welcome note. Thank you very much, Raja. It's indeed a historic moment where RSS, DI, AIOS, and VRSI have made a collaborative effort today to have a workshop on a very important topic, which we are all aware, and a problem which needs to be tackled by all of us together, by general ophthalmologists, by retina specialists, and by the endocrinologists. I would like to thank Dr. Banshi Sabu and Dr. Sanjay Agarwal and Dr. Namrata Sharma for uh, encouraging this effort and, and also not, least, not the least, uh, Dr. Raja Narayanan, for whose I feel it was his brainchild, and Dr. Padmaja Kumari and Dr. Rajiv Raman for taking it forward and structuring it. Uh, I think this workshop will be the first of its kind in my knowledge in the country which will uh, pave the way for uh, future management and collaboration between endocrinologists and ophthalmologists. Thank you very much, Raja. Let's not, uh, let's go ahead with the program. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sobhi Chawla. I now request uh, Dr. Banshi Sabu to set the stage uh, for this workshop with his uh, few encouraging words and the overall objectives of this. Thank you, Raja. First of all, thanks for inviting me as well as RSSDI to join for this wonderful workshop. I congratulate you for this wonderful program which you are organizing. Uh, thanks, Dr. Chawla, who is currently president of the Turretinal Society. And thanks, Dr. Namrata, who is secretary for All India Ophthalmological Society. As we know that RSSDA is one of the biggest organization of professionals who are practicing diabetes in India. We have more than 8,000 members. But in India, we have more than 40,000 physicians who are practicing medicine along with diabetes. As we know that diabetes is very common disorders now. And almost in adult population, you can see between 15 to 20 percent of the population are suffering from diabetes. If you see any general medicine OPD or internal medicine OPD, you will find one third of the patients who are sitting in the outdoor patient department, you will find they are having diabetes. So that type of incidence we have across the country. Uh, as we know that diabetes is not just hyperglycemia, it's a complication of multiple organs. So over a period of time, if somebody is not keeping very good control, maybe in five years to 15 years or 20 years, many of them, they develop complication. Microvascular and macrovascular, two major complications, but are two third of diabetic patients, they may develop simultaneously cardiovascular disease. So the major burden of a diabetes is like CVD, but in recent last few decades, we started understanding the importance of retina and nephro uh, kidney problem also equally important. And many of our patients, they 
have these problems and retinopathy is one of the very devastating complication of diabetes because it is not only a very costly problem but at the same time if somebody becomes blind because of diabetes retinopathy i think uh, the quality of life is very much hampered for those patients many of physicians started screening for this but still the annual screening program for a diabetes retinopathy is not done properly at many of the physicians clinic and this is one of the reason that most of the patients who landed at retina clinic or a ophthalmologist already they have uh, severe retinal problem or already they have uh, quite Uh, you know already complication had already started so much so then you know the early screening is the only answer for this prevention of this complication now problem is ke most of the time the ophthalmologist and diabetologist they are not working on a same platform or they are not working uh, in a one clinic we don't have so many dedicated diabetes care center those who can afford to have a retina specialist in their clinic it's not possible so i mean at one point we have to work together and this is i think one of the initiative which is taken initiated by dr raja and really i am thankful and me and dr sanjay had collaborated with the society so now retina society as well as the diabetic society we can work together to improve or increase the awareness of diabetes retinopathy amongst the physician what we are expecting those all 40000 or 60000 physician what is the most cost effective method for them to have a retina screening that is number one they are looking for the second when they should refer the patient for that and then what is the most cost effective treatment for their patient because many of these patients are uh, you know they 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 just can't understand the importance of this retina screening program because most of the time they tell that once we tell them that you have to go and get your eye checked up and they tell them no no doctor i can see everything i am perfectly fine i don't have any issue so i mean to aware them to make them aware about this problem itself is very difficult again the last time raja had shown that you know some radio jingle which we had created i mean it was again created by uh, raja and then it was supported by rssd the primary idea was to increase mm-hmm. awareness about this is one of the important complication which our diabetic patients may have the other complications which we have in diabetic they can be measured through some lab reports or uh, some investigation but most of the diabetologist or physicians are uh, not good in ophthalmic examination and they can't do it and now we started using some of the retina examination instruments which have artificial intelligence also and which can help us but still uh, in rural area and many parts of the country and many physicians many hospitals many internal medicine department they don't have all those instruments which a diabetic patients can have easily a detection of diabetic retinopathy so with this workshop and i don't think only a single workshop can work we are uh, trying in each and every diabetic meeting there should be a one program related to this diabetic retinopathy and what we are expecting from a retina specialist not for high fi treatment which they provide to their patient who is having already established retinopathy i just want that my physician should know more about that when they should be screened when they should refer and what is the most cost effective method for screening as well as for uh, treatment i mean these two things are very very important uh, for them to know they may not be interested to know that when you are going to give the injection when you are going to do the laser but you know they want to know whether it is oct is a better or it is the just simple uh, angiography which is retinal angiography which is better or which is more cost effective for them to detect uh, early retinopathy i mean that is what they are looking for so they may not be interested for some some of the newer advances which you might be having so uh, that type of program we want to keep in our all diabetic meeting to make our physicians to have more awareness about the diabetic retinopathy we know that epidemiological also we can work together to know what is the data exactly how many patients are really having early diabetic retinopathy even at the time of diagnosis if you know that uk pds had shown that even at the time of diagnosis that is a long story before almost 30 years back that 25% of the patients even at the time of diagnosis may have diabetic retinopathy i, I don't know what is the status even in our country and we would like to have 
is some common project, at least some real world data which can be published combinedly by uh, diabetologists, by RSSDI, along with ophthalmology society or by the China society that what is exactly the incidence prevalence at the time of diagnosis, after five years of diagnosis, after 10 years of diabetes, uh, somebody who's diagnosed, what is the incidence and prevalence of diabetic retinopathy in our country? So with these few words, once again, I thank Dr. Raja, Dr. Chawla, Dr. Namrata uh, for giving us a platform and we are working together. And thank to Dr. Dr. Rani and Dr. Rajiv, who are the brainchild for this particular program and this workshop. Thank you. Once again, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Banshi Sabo. Uh, on behalf of VRSI, uh, thank you for setting the stage for this uh, excellent, uh, actually, objective setting which you have made. Uh, you have put all the important things in your brief talk of about less than 10 minutes. You have exactly told what is the requirement for physicians and what the ophthalmologists should look for when they want to collaborate with physicians. Even the great points you have made about trying to bring out combined data about diabetic retinopathy in India. I think you have the best people here, Rajiv Raman and Padmaja, who will, can definitely work with your society to bring out any more uh, data awareness publication, what is the actual state of diabetic retinopathy in our country. So excellent points that you have made. I am hopeful that this workshop, although one workshop would not solve the problem, I'm sure Padmaja will take it further for further uh, interactions. I now request Dr. Namrata Sharma, Honorary Secretary of AIS, which plays a very important role in overall, uh, not just even retina specialists actually seek guidance from AIS on what should be the role overall. And the AIS has its own uh, committee on diabetic retinopathy. They are also doing a lot of work. Now I request Dr. Namrata Sharma to give uh, uh, her guidance to this workshop. Uh, thank you, Raja. And I would like to thank all the organizers, uh, Dr. Raja Narayan, Dr. Rajiv Raman, Dr. Shobhit Chavla, Dr. Banshi Sabu, and Dr. Padma Jarani, and Dr. Sanjay Garwal for taking this initiative for making it happen. And I'm sure it is going to produce uh, great results. Now, as far as AIOS is concerned, we have been involved with diabetic retinopathy at the AIOS level, as well as at the VRSI level. And several of the initiatives uh, have been taken, uh, which include uh, a project which was done last year, which was the fixing the mi missing link, a pan-India project, where almost uh, 40, uh, it spanned over 40 districts. Uh, and there were 40 camps which were organized in these districts and we screened more than 1500 patients and to our surprise there were almost 25 percent of the patients 21 to 25 percent who were diagnosed in the uh, clinics of the physicians as having diabetic retinopathy where it had not been diagnosed earlier so we did provide with the funders cameras in these districts and our uh, staff, it, they went and it was, of course, supported by the IOS as well as by the sponsorship from the various companies. But uh, this is something I think which needs to be done. And uh, apart from this, we've been collaborating with the IMA also for prevention of diabetic blindness, not in a very big way, but in the form of uh, the uh, activities for the public so that the public becomes aware about it in the form of public webinars. Then our ECOIN of the community of ophthalmology departments, um, as well as the community of ophthalmology society also are uh, uh, doing camps uh, for screening of the diabetic uh, retinopathy. So uh, I would, uh, I'm sure uh, today's workshop would be very useful for all the uh, ophthalmologists, as well as for all the physicians who are attending it. And I would like to thank the, uh, the uh, Research uh, uh, Society for the Study of Diabetes in India for taking this initiative. As I said, diabetes is a pan-organ uh, disease and to just uh, uh, you know, take eye into consideration, we are thankful to the um, uh, Research Society for the Study of Diabetes in India to do that. Uh, I would again uh, like to thank uh, VRSI President Dr. Shobhe Chavla, Raja and Rajiv Raman as well as Dr. Padmaja who are actually the torch bearers of uh, the diabetic retinopathy program, uh, whether it is at the level of uh, uh, at the level of the ophthalmologist or at the level of the physicians and I'm sure uh, this program is going to benefit everybody in a great manner. 
So thank you, uh, everyone, and thank you uh, for involving AIOS in it. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Namrata, for your encouraging words. I'm sure uh, there will be many more to follow, and we have a long challenge ahead of us. Uh, with these uh, introductory words, I now request uh, Dr. Padmaja Kumari Rani uh, to start the workshop. Uh, she will be uh, actually uh, presenting a few talks, and then Dr. Sanjay Agarwal, Honorary Secretary of RSSDI, will also give us the perspective of diabetes, what we should know about diabetes, not just in relation to retinopathy, but in general also. And then we will have a few talks by Dr. Rajiv Brahman on referral guidelines and management. And then we will end with uh, interactive quiz and uh, post-assessment feedback. So over to you, Padmaja. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I think this is a unique moment, moment and a great beginning in my uh, career uh, to see beginning of a diabetologist and ophthalmologist working together. And uh, this is something happening uh, on uh, due to unique association that is happening between RSSDI, AOS and VRSA workshop. So many of you might have uh, received uh, this uh, pre-assessment form. I'm just keeping it for a moment uh, for you to again capture. And uh, in this workshop, uh, the first talk will be touching upon epidemiology, pathogenesis, and classification of diabetic retinopathy. So when we look at world's most populated countries uh, in Asian countries, the China is actually having the highest number of people of diabetes followed by India. And when we look at diabetes uh, in uh, Dr. Sabu's address, it is not just eye alone, but it can cause uh, you know, multi-system disease. So, but eye can act as a window and that's how it is an important uh, 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 first step, how a diabetic retinopathy screening can help to even detect the other micro and macro vascular complications. So when we look at uh, globally, there are 415 million people with diabetes and 50% of them are living in China, India, and USA. So when we look at epidemiology of diabetic retinopathy, Asian scenario, so various prevalence studies, they found that in 100 people, when we screen for diabetic retinopathy, 20 to 40% can have some form of diabetic retinopathy. So why this Asian epidemic versus global scenario? So we do have... Uh, configuration of thin fat Indian. So where we have increased visceral fat and waist circumference, which in turn can reduce the insulin sensitivity and beta cell function and rapid economic growth and lifestyle changes. We know that the TVs in front of us are becoming bigger and bigger and uh, the individuals are thinner and thinner and the individuals who are sitting in front are becoming obese because of uh, sedentary lifestyle changes. And there is also phenomena of lower birth weight babies, and there is a catch-up growth and insulin uh, resulting in insulin resistance, and then again having a risk for type 2 diabetes. And similarly, migrant Indians, wherever we are uh, in whichever countries because of the lifestyle changes, and the, again, the genetic preservation, we are again having a high risk of type 2 diabetes. Then the most important why diabetic retinopathy can cause blindness is again the most important uh, reason is the awareness. So here we can have a, a, a 32 year old physician who came actually with an advanced diabetic retinopathy due to type 2 diabetes. And this can be uh, across, it ha doesn't have any socioeconomic barriers in terms of awareness. And we see both lower and as, uh, as upper socioeconomic status. And one third doesn't even know that they have even have a diabetes. But the good news is the blindness due to diabetes is preventable. And when we look at diabetic uh, uh, retinopathy, when we say diabetic retinopathy in individual with diabetes, when we screen for 100 people with uh, uh, diabetes for eye problems, 60% of them will actually have refractive errors and cataract 40% and glaucoma optic nerve uh, related problems in 10% and diabetic retinopathy 20%. And most of them also will have retinal vascular occlusion in around 
And sometimes the individuals with diabetes can have painless visual loss, which we call it as ischemic optic neuropathy. And sometimes the patient with uh, people with diabetes can just walk in in your clinic saying that I have double vision and which is again due to diabetes affecting the blood supply of the extracular muscles resulting in now the third nerve palsy or sixth nerve palsy and they can present with double vision. So this is the whole spectrum. We call it as diabetic eye disease and all can cause severe visual loss or even blindness. So when we look at retina, eye is like a camera. Retina is the most important sensitive layer. And when we say diabetic retinopathy workshop, it's not just only diabetic retinopathy workshop, we are, uh, uh, signs and symptoms. We need to look at when you see a normal retina. So we need to look at the optic disc, uh, which is actually uh, a healthy optic disc will be pink with because of the neurotrin pink in color, margins will be clear, a pink disc, and also along with the retina. And the central part, which we call as the macula, which is the posterior pole, the side, uh, which is respond and the foveal center, which is responsible for the sight sense, the near reading and writing visual acuity. So a normal retina, the transference of the retina is uh, uh, what is very important. And this, uh, this picture one should keep in mind. And when we uh, say the patients, people with diabetes, we always tell them that they should go for a dilated eye examination. So we dilate the people and these kind of videos having in the uh, in awareness material will help them to understand why they need to have a dilated examination. So Dr. Sabu was mentioning what is the most cost effective screening is a simple fundus photograph, either dilated or with a non midriatic fundus photography at the clinic. And this is a normal retina. And when we look at uh, a patient with uh, diabetes, uh, when you do the same dilated eye examination, what you see is a diabetic retinopathy affection changes uh, and uh, uh, which will be involving and can be when it is involving the center, we say the side threatening diabetic retinopathy. So let us look at pathogenesis of diabetic retinopathy. I would summarize diabetic retinopathy pathogenesis in a simple terminology. What I would describe as red dots, yellow lesions, and flowers. So when we look at pathogenesis, the, the diabetic retinopathy initially, because of the high glucose levels, there is a uh, 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 basement membrane thickening and blood vessel supply less. And there is an ischemic stage, initial stage. So diabetic retinopathy is the microvascular complication of diabetes. So what we, uh, what we see initially is the red dots is why, why it happens is because the normal retina has a 10 layers. So the transparency of the, the retina is the extension of the brain and which is a transparent layer. So to have a clear vision, the film should be clear. There should not be any swelling. So we have two policemen which will actually keep the retina transparent. They are called inner blood retinal barrier and outer blood retinal barrier. Inner blood retinal barrier is nothing but the, all the retinal blood vessels in a normal retina, you have a cells called pericytes. And these keep uh, actually the retina, uh, uh, the retinal layer intact, the retinal endothelium intact so that the no leakage occurs. But in a diabetic retina, the first sign that occurs is the pericytes are lost. So it means these pericytes, the inner policeman is not working. And that is when these blood vessels, they form like an outpouching, there's a capillaries. And that what is that outpouching that you see on the fundus, the first red dot or the deep red dot, we call microneurism. So the first pathological sign is the parasite loss. And the first clinical sign that you see on a fundus photograph is the red dot. So this is the earliest stage of diabetic retinopathy. And then, then comes, uh, uh, as the diabetic retinopathy, the, as the ischemia is increasing, the stages. So what will happen is uh, the outer policeman, we say the retinal pigment epithelium. So the retinal pigment epithelium junctions, they actually become tight and they actually, uh, they are like a scavenger and they will not allow anything to leak outside the retina so that the retina remains the transparent. But when the RP junctions are not functioning because of the diabetes, so again, the proteins, the lipids, uh, which are in the blood circulation, they enter the retina. And that is how you see, start seeing the yellow spots. The yellow spots that we see due to diabetic retinopathy are two in number. One is we call cotton wool spot. 
which will appear as if it is stuck on the surface of the retina, first layer. And there are hard exudates, which are nothing but the lipid and protein deposits, which get accumulated. So uh, first sign is the pericyte loss and the inner policeman not working. And that is how red dots will appear. When outer blood retinal barrier, RP is function is not happening. And that is when you start seeing the yellow spot, like cotton wool spots and hard exudates appearing. And when these, in these stages, the most important vision threatening retinopathy occur is in the mild or moderate or in a severe is the because of the leakage, uh, there's a capillary leakage and there can be a thickening of the macula that is what we call macular edema. And as the ischemia is progressing, just imagine retina and the eye like a garden. So there is a factor called angiogenesis factor, which we call vascular endothelial growth factor, and which gets released. And that results in started of what I said about flowers. So that is what new vessels. So these new vessels are not as strong as the original blood vessels. And that is when you actually develop uh, these, uh, uh, the patient, even if it has a Valsalva retinopathy or any increased exercise, they can even develop a floaters and then causes the vitreous hemorrhage. And as the uh, neovascular, these new vessels increase started and they actually, the, as the blood sugar, the vitreous is also has a rich in glucose and it is, a, and it's like acts like a manure and all these new vessels can actually grow like a big, big trees. And, and then when the, when this kind of a big flowers are new vessels, when they start forming and that actually this vitreous can kind of contracts and one, you can have a tractional induced retinal detachment or because the retinal layer itself become thin and the new vessels start proliferating and contracting and one can even develop a breaks and can have a combined retinal detachment. So that's how a normal retina initially it may just start as a microneurisms and uh, hard exudates, but with the growth of these flowers and the proliferative diabetic retinopathy, where you can have a uh, even a tractional vitreous hemorrhage, tractional induced advanced retinopathy like a tractional induced retinal detachment. So this is in nutshell about pathogenesis of diabetic retinopathy. Let us look at classification of diabetic retinopathy. So the important classification of diabetic retinopathy that we follow, which is called International Clinical Diabetic Retinopathy Disease Severity Scale. This classification has two components. One is a diabetic retinopathy disease severity and another is diabetic macular edema severity scale. So this classification has been introduced basically in most with the important objective of that both physician as well as an ophthalmologist can follow this classification based on even on a one single fundus photograph. So the single fundus photograph, when I say it could be around uh, 45 degrees fundus photograph, uh, whether it is a physician clinic or an ophthalmologist can follow this classification. So this classification says mild NPDR, mild non as we discussed already, a single red dot also qualifies as a microaneurysms. And this is the first sign of diabetic retinopathy, which we call it as a mild NPDR and which is due to loss of pericytes. And when we say red, so, uh, red spots, red dots, so the other red dots that can occur in fundus are hemorrhages. So how you can differentiate microaneurysm from hemorrhage? Microaneurysms are usually will be smaller and many times because of the earliest stage, the microaneurysms also starts can leaking and they can have surrounding small, small yellow spots like hard exudates. So that's how one can actually differentiate between microaneurysm and hemorrhage. hemorrhage depending on the layer in which the hemorrhage is there. For example, a hemorrhage which is there on the retinal surface will be more like a flame shaped and deeper layer can be dot and blot and the margins will be much more, uh, the hemorrhage will be little larger than the microneurism and the margins can be irregular. Let second uh, stage is moderate diabetic moderate NPDR and moderate non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy. Here, as we just discussed, apart from the red spot, when you start seeing cotton wool spots and hard exudates, and that is when we call this as a moderate NPDR. And when you see these uh, both red spots and yellow spots occurring at least in two quadrants, then we call it as a moderate no, 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 moderate NPDR. 
So when we look at, for example, here I was discussing about different, different red spots. So these are the microneurisms. And as I said, that when the retinal hemorrhages are at the nerve fiber layer, that means at the stage of the, the as you, that the first layer that you see on a fundus photograph, that is when we call it as a flame-shaped hemorrhages. But the two important yellow spots here we discuss is cotton wool spots. They appear as if they are stuck on the surface of the retina. They are the most superficial. Whereas hard exudate will be appearing in the middle layers of the retina. And where, uh, the, then this is called as a moderate NPDR. The other yellow spot that you can see in fundus, which call it as a drusin, which can be at the more deeper level. And that is more related to age-related macular degeneration. But the important sign, yellow spots that are concerned with diabetic retinopathy are cotton wool spots and hard exudate. Third uh, stage is severe NPDR. Here, remember 4 to 1 rule. What is 4 to 1 rule? For example, when you have given a fundus photograph, when you have more than four, 20 intraretinal hemorrhages in all four quadrants, and then venous changes at least in two quadrants, and the third uh, uh, structure we call as a IRMA. IRMA is nothing but intraretinal microvascular anomaly. This is something like a pre flower stage. So because the proliferative diabetic retinopathy, as I said, flowers are new vessels. So this is something like a, an attempt at uh, severity, which is severe and PDR can go into PDR. However, for all practical purposes, when you see a fundus photo, and if you are seeing hemorrhages in all four quadrants, you should err on the side of severe uh, NPDR. Along with that, you can see a cotton wool spots depending on the level of the ischemia and also the hard exudates. And uh, uh, when you do an angiogram, IRMA is a, on fundus photograph, sometimes it may be difficult to differentiate. But when you do an angiogram, the new vessels, because they lack completely the uh, retinal endothelial junctions, they leak profusely, whereas IRMA may not leak so profusely. So IRMA is one differentiating feature, how we can say severe NPDR. But to practical purposes, in when it's given a fundus photo, if you see hemorrhages in all four quadrants, you should classify that as a severe NPDR. Then fourth stage is proliferative diabetic retinopathy. So when we say sight threatening retinopathy, diabetic retinopathy, we say from severe NPDR, we, cla uh, we uh, classify it as a vision threatening retinopathy or sight threatening retinopathy. So in proliferative diabetic retinopathy, the important factor, the vascular endothelial growth factor plays a role. And here you can see those fibrovascular proliferation. That is nothing but the vitreous scaffold. I just said that uh, you should imagine the eye like a garden. So the vitreous scaffold and all these new blood vessels, they start proliferating on this scaffold of the vitreous. So that's how you see these new vessels. So whenever you have a small hemorrhage kind of thing, whether it is a new vessels or anything, if you see a glistening fibrovascular tissue, then you know that that could be a new vessels. And the new vessels will not be, uh, will, will be like a fibrillary, tangulary mesh of blood vessels. And they will, uh, and of course, with the increased ischemic, they can be more uh, uh, stronger uh, uh, caliber also, but you, usually they will not be like a regular blood vessel. And they can have a vitreous hemorrhage in the form of just behind the highlight, then we say subhyalid hemorrhage, which is like a boat shape, or it can be a vitreous hemorrhage. However, if a 40 year old or any 50, any uh, diabetic patient with a diabetes, if they come with a pre retinal hemorrhage like this, so you should definitely uh, consider that it could be a proliferative diabetic retinopathy with a new vessel behind, which could be a simple Valsalva retinopathy and should rule out always diabetic retinopathy. And as I said, advanced with high risk characteristics. When we say PDR with high risk characteristics, this neovascularization, which is more than uh, we, everything in uh, retina, we actually try to uh, measure along with the disc diameters. If it is more than one third disc diameter and big fibrovascular proliferation, or any NVD with pre retinal or vitreous hemorrhage, or NV which is more than half disc diameter, then these are all called it as a high risk characteristics. So any proliferative diabetic retinopathy fundus photo, if you have a pre-retinal vitreous hemorrhage, that classifies as a high-risk characteristic. And here you can see a, a big growth of new vessel proliferation, uh, which you can see that then behind retina, and it can cause even a tractional detachment. And if it is a significant, it can even cause a combined retinal detachment. And uh, the next important vision-threatening retinopathy is diabetic macular edema. So when we say sight-threatening retinopathy, one is severe NPDR and PDR. 
and uh, the diabetic macular edema is again the site threatening diabetic retinopathy so when we say diabetic macular edema so one classification we do follow is uh, in the clinic by an ophthalmologist is a clinically significant macular edema where we say whenever there is a hard x rays or zone of retinal thickening which is involving the foveal center and the retinal thickening is common and this is we call it as clinical because it is based on your slit lamp biomicroscopy or using a 78d lens however International Clinical Diabetic Macular Disease CVRD scale. This can be this classification is just based on the fundus photograph, which can be followed by both physician as well as an ophthalmologist. What does this say? So, whenever uh, according to uh, ICDRS classification, diabetic macular edema is classified as a mild, moderate, and severe. What is mild? When you have hard exudates or an, uh, yellow dots, which are away from the foveal center, which we call it as a mild. Uh, DME and moderate DME when you have hard exudates and many attempts when you have these hard exudates can in the form of sarcinate like like a circulus and you can see many attempts there can be a microneurisms which are there in the center of the sarcinate but what uh, what is the definition is when these hard exudates are approaching the foveal center we classify it as a moderate DME and when hard exudates are involving the foveal center we call it as a severe DME. So when you say vision threatening diabetic macular edema from moderate and uh, severe uh, DME, both will come under as a vision threatening diabetic retinopathy. So when we said that in 100 people with diabetes, you can have 20% have any form of diabetic retinopathy. The vision threatening retinopathy can be 10% and the, in the 10%, 8% can be actually diabetic macular edema, which could be moderate or severe DME. And this is a, also a reason why a patient can say that I am having blurred uh, vision uh, when they walk in either in physician clinic or an ophthalmologist clinic. So to capture, just to revise, a normal fundus will not have any, it is the more, the retina will be the transparent membrane and the hue of the retina is mainly due to the choroid which is beneath. So depending on the racial region, it could be uh, uh, tessellated or it could be a grayish, uh, orange hue. The color of the choroid is what we'll see through. And this retinal transparency is maintained by the two policemen. One is the pericytes in the inner retina. If they are lost, the first clinical sign that you see is a microneurisms that we call mild NPDR. And when you have outer policemen, that is red RP junctions are not functioning actively, then you can see that uh, along with red spots in two more than two quadrants, you can see either hard exudates or a cotton wool spots that is moderate NPDR. And in a severe NPDR 421 rule, where you have all four quadrants uh, hemorrhages and could be cotton wool spots, which you can see is like a stuck on the surface of the retina or a hard exudate, then you say it is a severe NPDR. And IRMA can be a, an angiography diagnosis called intraretinal macrovascular anemoly. This is like a preflower stage in severe NPDR. And uh, uh, the proliferative diabetic retinopathy can be like a vitreous hemorrhage. This is a high risk characteristics, any PDR with NVD. And you can see the new vessels or the flowers or new vessels will be very, very thin caliber. And you can also see the venous beading changes seen very clearly. So these are all changes indicates a proliferative diabetic retinopathy. And they can progress to either tractional or advanced PDR with combined retinal detachment. So this is my first talk. So you can go on to your second presentation and then we will take some questions. Yeah. So I'll just talk about uh, what are the uh, important uh, ocular investigations that we do in diabetic retinopathy. So the important investigations that uh, uh, one can uh, uh, see is that fundus photography, that is the most cost effective way one can do the diabetic retinopathy screening. And the investigations where we, an ophthalmologist would go further uh, is the fundus fluorescent angiography, uh, ultra wide field and OCT angiography, which is a non-invasive way of getting the information what FFA can provide. Uh, so OCT and OCT angiography and ultrasound B scan. Uh, so these are the fundus photography to OCT angiography are mainly, these are the investigations that we use when the patients present with clear media. That is, there is no cataract and we can really image the retina well. However, sometimes the patient can present with a media which is hazy, then we can have to go for ultrasound B scan. 
So when we look at uh, fundus photography, it is useful for the diagnosis, screening, documentation, pre-op considerations, and also as a uh, follow-up uh, tool. So the fundus photography is a gold standard uh, in a way to diagnose, screen, document, and monitor diabetic retinopathy progression. Then in comes, uh, uh, when it comes to angiography, uh, we need to understand that the fluorescein angiography is uh, can be used whenever you have a media opacity to know any proliferative diabetic retinopathy or when you are having an asymmetric uh, diabetic retinopathy to rule out whether there is any vascular events like ocular ischemic syndrome or sometimes the patient uh, vision is not correlating and when you are suspecting uh, unexplained visual loss and when you are suspecting any macular ischemia and also, sometimes there can be an associated choroidal, uh, other, other pathology due to AMD, which can be CNVM. However, FFA is never used for screening for diabetic retinopathy because it is, a non -in, it is an invasive modality. So, fundus photography is the most important screening modality. So, for example, in this patient with a cataract haze, the FFA can help us to detect underlying new vessels which will leak profusely. And sometimes uh, choroidal neovascular membrane can occur as a coincidentally, for example, when we have a, a macular edema and we have treated and when there is an intense laser burns and sometimes a CNVM can occur. So a diabetic retinopathy, one important tip is that you can see dot hemorrhages, blot hemorrhages, but if you, the subretinal hemorrhage is not an usual feature in diabetic retinopathy. When there is hemorrhage occurring behind the retina, that means there could be an associated CNVM. That's how one could suspect a CNVM where FFA can play a role. A gold standard investigation uh, FFA role is in asteroid hyalosis, where uh, because FFA will have both exciter and barrier filters, and the asteroid hyalosis is a condition where there are a lot of calcium soaps and which will hinder the visualization of underlying retinal structures. Whereas when you do an angiography in these patients, we can grade easily because the, uh, the, uh, the all these reflectance from these uh, particles can be actually uh, blocked by the barrier filter allowing the visualization. So one of the uh, important investigations where we do an FFA to grade the diabetic retinopathy is in asteroid hyalosis. And unexplained visual loss. So this is a patient who came with uh, uh, diabetic retinopathy changes and you can see some hard exudates are there and some hemorrhages are there. And here, this is the central part, which is important, which we call foveal avascular zone. And uh, uh, when we do an angiogram, but the patient was having only CF one meter. And when we do an angiogram, we clearly see that the complete macular ischemia is there. That means this zone is wiped off. But along with that, we could also detect what we could not see, the subtle neovascularization could be easily picked up by uh, an FFA in terms of the increased leakage. So that's how FFA can be useful. OCT is a, a very popular and uh, important investigation in a diabetic retinopathy. It is something uh, like a histological section or it will cause a histological biopsy of the retinal layers, what we discussed about the 10 layers. And uh, the, as uh, the name says, optical coherence tomography, it is just because of the light wave coherently and we are able to slice the retinal structures. It is again extremely useful in diagnosis and documenting of the macular edema, uh, the central part, whether the changes are there, the thickening is there. It is again, because of the non-invasive nature, it is the most useful. And it can also help us when we do any laser treatment or an injections as a monitoring of response. Also, OCT is again, very, very useful. OCT is also extremely useful. For example, a diabetic macular edema, which is not responding to the uh, injections or anything. And when there is any tractional element due to vitreous interface, tractional edema, or when we think that this is an indication for surgery, again, OCT can play a very role in documenting that traction. OCT is most important role that has been envisaged recently is also as a prognosis that because the uh, the biomarkers that the retinal layers which are there the the important layers because of the spectral domain oct we can even see the photoreceptor layer which are the important layers responsible for the site so the oct can tell us if these structures are disrupted 
and also whether the inner layers are disrupted. So this is very important because uh, a patient who is having uh, intact uh, uh, photoreceptors and when you have given injections, uh, there is a likely chance that the patient vision will improve. Whereas, for example, in this patient, the pre-injection uh, also the vision is 21-25, after injection also in 25, OCT might be doing well, but because of the layers disruption, it may not help the patient very well. So that's how OCT can help as a pro uh, prognostic factor. Another important uh, recent uh, investigation is OCT angiography, which without dye, we will be able to section the layers and get the same information as what an angiography can provide us. And the import, uh, in this, the area of interest, the diabetic retinopathy, where OCT angio can be useful because of the foveal avascular zone delineation, very clearly it will dominate. And this is all without injection of any dye. We are getting the best quality pictures as the, uh, the which kind of sections can be done. That is OCT acta. And similarly, playing a very important role just based on octa macular scans one can just see and classify whether it is because the foveal avascular zone normal foveal avascular zone should be intact and margin should be very clear but based on the octa one can classify diabetic retinopathy severity when there is a lot of capillary dropout and lot of ischemia one can even classify diabetic retinopathy based on the octa fhz uh, pitch features and because there is no dye leakage in octa, the extent of the ischemia, macular ischemia, also can be delineated very well. And similarly, octa also can classify the not only the determine the extent and also the new vessels can be seen very well. So this is all non-invasive. So for example, in a clinic, a patient comes after because a non-invasive investigation, we are getting the same information as an angiography uh, it can determine the extent and depth of the new vessels. This is a pregnant lady with a silent neovascularization like a wispy neovascular NVD and other was having periodontal hemorrhage. Octa can actually help us to determine the new vessels very clearly. And it can also helpful as a follow-up tool. For example, you have given treatment in the form of uh, injections and uh, lasers, then one can see that the disappearance of uh, new vessels also can be demonstrated very clearly. And uh, I just discussed about asteroid hyalosis and use of FFA. Here, uh, Octa also can play a role uh, in determining the lesions uh, by uh, whether the new vessels. However, we need to understand Octa has a limitation or OCT has a limitation. It will only be a, 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 the extent of the area, whereas FFA gives you a more bigger composite picture, whereas Octa will, wherever the scan goes, that much area only it can actually image and visualize it. And this is a case of uh, an asteroid hyalosis. So the future, the initial limitation octa has been the limited fields like 3 into 3 mm or 12 into 12 mm. But now we have a wide angle octa, which is able to helpful for us to detect the lesions in much more clearly. For example, this patient came with, uh, uh, this is a wide field fundus photography, which we do in a retinal uh, clinics and where the patient has a, having only a pre-retinal hemorrhage here. And when you did an octa, wide angle octa, you could see the new vessels very clearly and can determine the grade of the uh, classification. And now let us look at the last uh, investigation. When you, a patient comes with a medial haze, like a, for example, a known diabetic comes with a cataract. So this is where you see that uh, there are a lot of crystalline uh, kind of a deposits and one could think that it could be vitreous hemorrhage. So that is one differential. But here one need to clearly observe that you can see very clearly that uh, along with the crystalline deposit, there is a equalescent space beneath. So this is actually a case of a, uh, a asteroid hyalosis. And B-scan will be extremely useful in uh, documenting that there is a change. Similarly, uh, uh, in a case of uh, vitreous hemorrhage, one can see that there will be a lot of, uh, uh, there is no equalescent space beneath and you can see the membranous echoes. But B-scan is also extremely useful. What are the, not whether is it only vitreous hemorrhage and as I said, initially only eye is like a garden and vitreous will be a lot of tractional attachments. So is it only a, a hemorrhage which is there just behind the hyoid in the vitreous or is there a pull on the retina like a, you know, tractional detachment or it is, is it having a broad attachment? So it will tell us a prognostic, uh, B-scan also is an extremely useful prognostic factor, what we are going to expect after clearing the vitreous hemorrhage. Thank you.
Yes, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Padmaja, for the detailed presentations. Uh, I think you have covered a lot of aspects of pathogenesis, uh, classification, even the findings which normally, uh, you know, we have to be aware of what is normal, what is abnormal. But the key points from this workshop, uh, as Dr. Sabu had mentioned, uh, if we can condense them into, let's say, two or three questions, I would like to ask you, one is on the referral, the other is on the diagnosis. I, you had shown one of, you know, the, one of the first photographs of the slide. There was a physician who had type 1 diabetes and had advanced proliferative diabetic retinopathy. Now, we have a tactile diabetic retinopathy from the awareness aspect. You spread awareness that diabetes can affect the eye. But even if someone has the awareness, it is not converted into practice many times. We have a very common example nowadays of coronavirus. You say mask and social distance, nobody follows. Awareness is there, but does not get converted into practice as if nothing will happen to me. What are your thoughts on tackling awareness and practice gap? So I think the most important diabetic retinopathy can be tackled only by an integrated approach. So the best model that can happen is only the physician-led model. I always believe that. So it has to be the fundus imaging should become the battery uh, should become the integral part of the battery of investigations that can be done in a battery uh, in the fundus clinic. Of course, uh, the physician should be assisted by. Uh, could be an assisted by an uh, allied personnel like an optometrist or a technicians. They can actually assist in terms of managing the, any related eye complication. But the best model will be the physician-led model where a fundus imaging should become the part and parcel. So when the, because he'll be the first contact of the diabetes. And when I said that 100 people, when we said 20% of them are diabetic retinopathy, and around 10% are macular edema or, uh, or the sight threatening retinopathy. Ultimately, it is all the systemic control. So the 90% of diabetic retinopathy is going to be managed by the systemic control. So I feel the physician office is the best place where we should start this approach. Yeah, and I would like to take the input of Dr. Sanjay here also. Coming back to that question, you also would be facing a lot of patients like this. You advise something, they understand, but they don't follow your advice. How do you deal with kind of a situation where one, you may have, you know, patients, you are advising them to undergo some tests or advising some medicine. They will not take the medicine. They will not come back to your follow-up. How do you tackle such kind of behavior? I think, uh, Dr. Raja, the crux is counseling. You know, we have to spend time counseling the patient. And most of the doctors don't tend to, you know, they tend to overlook this very much. Maybe because of short of time, they don't have trained staff to be counselors. They themselves with the pressure of work are not able to spend enough time. But I think if you spend enough time counseling the patient on the problems of diabetes, I would expect that majority of the patients uh, would tend to follow your advice. There would of course be fallouts on either side that, you know, you can't really account for. But I, you need good people who would, you know, sort of act as the counselors to guide them. Uh, as Dr. Padma just, uh, Padmaja just mentioned in her talk, and I was very keenly listening to her talk, that, you know, obviously, retinal screening is a very important part of the physician's examination. Now, most of us are not trained to look at the retinas in that manner. I mean, we do have uh, fundoscopes and stuff like that. A lot of us today have even fundus cameras in our clinic. We'll probably have technicians trained to clear, take the photographs either. But interpretation becomes a very important part, which, you know, we are not equipped to do it. Also, when we take fundus uh, photographs, we tend to overlook the peripheries, the deep peripheries, and that doesn't get captured. And I believe that that is an important area too that you need to look at. So you may get the central retina that is very well captured, but the peripheries may be completely missed out and you may still miss out a lesion. So I think... We need to have the collaboration with the Vitro Retinal Society to see how can there be a centralized process where people can get their fundus photographs interpreted or you train people to interpret fundus photographs for all those who have it. 
so that at least there is some meaningful meaning to that examination otherwise it just becomes another list of examination in the doctor's clinic and it goes into the file the photograph with no interpretation done so there has to be a further follow up and i think that can only happen either you we upload the photographs to a certain place and you help us or you have to train us to see how do we interpret the fundus photographs because examining the fundus is not everybody's task yeah i i totally agree uh, dr sanjay you brought up very valid points practical points you know one may have the expertise knowledge specialization as doctors we may be you know uh, having the latest technology but how to make it cross functional and scale it up to the millions of patients that require care is what needs to be tackled so in that context i think dr rajiv raman probably would be covering some aspects of definitely your questions we'll yes. come to him later on but due to paucity of time i think we need to move ahead and we will now go ahead with dr sanjay agrawal stock on systemic control uh, and diabetic admin thank you very much can you see my screen yes yes great wonderful i'll just yeah all right so i would like to thank the vitro retinal society as well as all india ophthalmological society to collaborate with the rssdi and i think this is such an important area that we need to cover and actually in the area of diabetes uh, discussions we tend to overlook this in a very big way so when you know dr raja and dr shobhit chawla approached dr bansi and me we were only very happy to take up this cause because it can probably lead to you know as much as possible prevention of blindness due to diabetes as a cause and uh, this workshop is going to go a long way to bridge the gap you know between the ophthalmologists the retinologists as well as the diabetologists to see how we can work effectively together to you know uh, bring the awareness of diabetes retinopathy as well as prevent you know blindness due to diabetes retinopathy so i'm just going to be very brief because the majority of this workshop should be actually trying to target uh, all about retinopathy but i was given the task to just highlight the fact that is systemic control of diabetes very important in prevention of retinopathy and that's my area that i'm really going to be talking about uh so diabetic retinopathy is a a uh, chronic progressive sight threatening disease and uh, retinal microvasculature uh, disease of the mi retinal microvasculature associated with prolonged hyperglycemia and other conditions linked to diabetes such as hypertension uh if you look at the prevalence almost about by the end of 2030 we're going to have more than 430 439 million people who are going to be suffering from diabetes and even if you take about 30% or 40% of these people in absolute numbers are going to have retinopathy at the end of it all that's a huge number of people that we are going to be looking at who's going to be suffering from diabetic eye disease now diabetes remains the leading cause of legal blindness between the ages of 25 to 65 years and this is from the western world and we just heard the statistics from india from dr padmaja so it is something that we should all be very concerned about and is responsible for almost about 1.8 million of the 37 million cause of blindness that are uh, present all across the world uh i'm just going to go back into history and this is where actually the retinopathy data comes from we were trying to see that what should be classified as an hpa1c value that should be said that okay is this patient a pre diabetic or a diabetic and this study comes from primarily from the pima indian study where they showed that at a uh, a1c of roughly between 6 to 6.5 the incidence of retinopathy uh, exponentially increases and this was also validated from studies from egypt and the enhanced study where they all showed that if they look at the fasting the 2r and the hba1c values there is a bimodal distribution when it comes to the fasting and 2r post meal on a oral glucose tolerance test where you see the you know the increase incidence of retinopathy when the fasting sugar is more than 100 and uh, when the post meal sugars are more than 200 but here the clearly you can see a sharp take off where the incidence of retinopathy takes off at about you know 6 to 6.5 and this is where actually we start talking about that you know what is the gold standard of normal uh, di differentiating between pre diabetes and diabetes so if you have to look at the 2 hour post meal glucose the fasting plasma glucose or the hba1c values 
we always talk about higher sensitivity and higher specificity so in a test with very high sensitivity negative rule uh, negative results rule out diagnosis but if the specificity is low there would also be many false positives and true positives will have to be identified by second more specific test which should be confirmatory and diagnostic so hence although we have data to show that uh, you know fasting glucose of more than 126 and a 2 hour glucose of more than 200 are cut off points for diagnosis of diabetes and associated diagnosis with hba1c of more than or equal to 6.5 acts as a confirmatory and that is why the ada finally decided that independently the a1c of more than 6.5 should be a criteria for diagnosis of diabetes so this is very important to understand that the entire data of normal to differentiate between normal and abnormal diabetes has been based on the retinopathy data we have seen this flow diagram from dr padmaja's talk that how hyperglycemia leads to diabetic retinopathy so it affects the retinal blood flow it causes a basement membrane thickening the growth factors are increased and all this leads to ultimately the vascular occlusion and vascular cell death leading to retinal hypoxia growth factors getting affected and ultimately the retinal neovascularization now these are some important facts that we should really be talking about in terms of you know diabetic retinopathy remember that once one diabetic complication starts complication begets complication so once one complication is there the second complication is just round the corner so the duration of diabetes is one of the best predictors of diabetic retinopathy in patients diagnosed of diabetes before the age of 30 years the incidence of diabetic retinopathy after 10 years is almost 50% and after 30 years is 90% and after 20 years of diabetes nearly 99% of the patients with type 1 and 60% with type 2 have some degree of diabetic retinopathy this is because the progressive diabetic retinopathy is a result of very high average blood glucose levels that are more likely to be in type 1s than type 2s but for some understood reasons the incidence of maculopathy is more common in type 2s than type 1s and diabetic retinopathy rarely develops within 5 years of onset of diabetes or before puberty but about 5% of type 2s have diabetic retinopathy at presentation so consequently you can also understand that uh, tight glycemic control is responsible for reduction of the incidences of uh, microvascular complications but the same doesn't hold true for macrovascular complications the macrovascular complications is all about summing up reduction uh, reduction of the risk factors so if you have high uh, hypertension or if you have diabetes or if you have dyslipidemia obesity so the reduction of all these risk factors ultimately re uh, reduces the incidence of macrovascular complication but there's a direct correlation between glycemic control and incidences of microvascular complications of which retinopathy is one of them a uh, poor glycemic control obviously as as a corollary we know would cause a progression of the diabetic retinopathy and i'm just going to allude to this a little while next so there were two classic trials that have been always quoted in history one is the dcct trial which is from the type 1 diabetic patients and the uk pds which was studied in the type 2 diabetic population and they randomized patients between conventional and intensive therapy and what they showed was that the patients who were in the intensive group had a reduction of retinopathy by 54% neuropathy by 60% nephropathy by 54% and macroalbuminuria by 39% and the follow up studies of the dcct the edic trial they showed that there was a progressive reduction of retinopathy to the tune of 76% and this was the you can see that uh, there was you know the, there were two arms of the initial study and when they were left alone and they were not followed up the two arms merged together but the benefit of good control in the initial years continued to exist even later on and that is why it is important that in the early stages of diabetes good control gives a legacy effect of good effect even at the later years of life so if you look at this data which came out from the retinopathy you can see in the primary prevention at the end of the follow up studies there was almost 76% of relative risk reduction in the seven, secondary prevention there was almost 54% risk reduction of retinopathy with good glycemic control 
The same is true also in the UK PDS study, which was done in type two diabetic patients. And here again, there was randomization between conventional and the intensive groups. And you can clearly see here that good glycemic control in the intensive arm relate, uh, caused any diabetes related endpoint to reduce by 12%, microvascular disease by 25%, myocardial infarction by 16%, and all cause mortality by 6%. And if you look at the follow-up study of the UK PDS, you find that this benefit of good glycemic control in the initial years continues to exist even when they were unmonitored. And you can see here that the, any diabetic-related endpoint continued to be at a lower incidence by 9%, microvascular disease by 24%, myocardial infarction by 15%, and all-cause mortality by 13%. So this was really the crux of talking point that all patients, when they come to us with early diagnosis and you know we detect them early, there has always got to be a clear emphasis on how patients can be controlled to the best possible glycemic control. The other thing that we should always keep in mind is pregnancy. And some, uh, sometimes associated when you have you know, existing diabetic retinopathy in patients who are getting pregnant. So patients who are pre-pregnancy di diabetes and have retinopathy and they tend to become pregnant, sometimes greater pre-pregnancy can, I mean, pre, with a pre-pregnancy retinopathy, you can get a uh, worsening of the retinopathy during the course of pregnancy. And especially if you exert control too rapidly during the early stages of pregnancy. And this possibly can be because of development of preeclampsia or fluid imbalance that they all can contribute to the worsening of the retinopathy during the pregnancy. Again, there is a close relationship between diabetes, hypertension, and retinopathy. And this is some of the classic landmark trials. The ABCD trial, which targeted the blood pressure to be between 140 to 80. And what they showed was tight control appears to particularly benefit type 2 diabetics with maculopathy. The Euclid trial, which showed lower rates of development of retinopathy in diabetics, taking lisinopril for antihypertensive medications as compared to placebo. We all know that if patients have diabetic nephropathy, they usually tend to have an associated retinopathy. So you have always got to be screening for retinopathy in presence of diabetic kidney disease. And they have shown that treatment of renal disease with ACRBs may be associated with improvement of retinopathy. So if I have to just sum that up as a risk factor where hypertension is con uh, concerned, it's very common in patients with type 2 diabetes. We should aim for a strict control. Where nephropathy is concerned, it's associated with worsening of the diabetic retinopathy. There is some data to show that renal transplantation may be associated with improvement of the diabetic retinopathy, and there's a better response to photocoagulation. Some of the other risk factors that we tend to overlook is obesity, hyperlipidemia, and anemia. So these are some things that we should never overlook. So if I have to really put in a nutshell, the other risk factors, smoking, the gender ratio, hyperlipidemia, obesity, anemia, and carotid artery occlusive disease, alcohol, all these are sort of concomitant risk factors that should never be ignored in patients with diabetes because ultimately all these are uh, sort of needles for developing any of the diabetic complications in future. So to sum it up, this is my last slide, that health, education, diet, and control remain the hallmark for prevention of diabetic retinopathy. We have seen with various studies that improved glucose control and blood pressure control reduces the risk of diabetic eye disease by one-fourth. It reduces the risk of severe visual impairment by more than half, the kidney damage by one-third, and stroke by one-third. So I'll stop here and thank you very much for your patient listening. And I would like to compliment both the societies to associate again with the RSSDI. And we look forward to work in collaboration with all of you to see how effectively can we make this change across the country. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Sanjay Agarwal. Actually, uh, we have lots of questions probably. Uh, but I will start with Dr. Banshi Sabu, actually. Uh, sir, you had mentioned in your initial introduction some specific requirements from the physicians and diabetologists side as to what you expect from us 
now uh, i think dr rajiv raman will be covering on the uh, guideline patterns and you know what are the different uh, investigations that are cost effective but uh, other than that related to dr sanjay agarwal stock when a patient of diabetic retinopathy comes to us as retina specialist we tell them you know control your sugar you know just we just say systemic control but i would like to know what kind of a communication pattern would you expect uh, as a diabetologist from a retina specialist and is there anything specific that you would look out for from a retina specialist so that you can take care of the overall systemic control of the patient should i answer for that i uh, yes i think the reinforcement of all the education which is done by a diabetologist or a physician you know just telling them ki you please keep your good glucose control is i think insufficient statement it requires the complete metabolic control most of the time i had seen even my colleagues who are retina specialist and ophthalmologist they will check the retina and they will just tell that you you need a good glucose control but i think if they can spare maybe 1 minute more or 2 minutes more to see that what about the lipids what is the renal function what medication patient is going on what are the previous reports of lipids and hba1c and you are just reinforcing the same education which a physician is also doing that you please get all these things to be controlled you know sometimes what happens the patient might be getting the treatment from a primary care physician and you are just saying that go to your physician the difference between a physician and a diabetologist is the same if it difference between a ophthalmologist and a retina specialist i am sure i think this one should be uh, one ophthalmologist should appreciate the same i mean just to tell him that you go to your primary care physician and get all these thing control i don't think it is so easy if it is so easy then why he should have uh, you know develop all those complications of diabetes i mean we must tell him that you know it requires a very good glycemic control without any glycemic variability last time you have 120 but before that you were having 220 your self monitoring is not done you are not having a good control of a1c your lipids are not well controlled your blood pressure is not getting good control and one more thing important thing is i am seeing in india we are having lot of patients who are on pioglitazone and macular edema is one of the complication yes which is most of the time i mean a ophthalmologist or a retina specialist is not putting any remark on it and patient continues it because the physicians uh, are just forgetting that a macular edema could be a relative contraindication of use of this rather i will request sanjay as well as the ophthalmic society as well as retina we can come out with a very good paper that what is the incidence those patients who are uh, of 5 years or 10 years of diabetes we can have a cut off and then how many patients on on more than 5 years of pioglitazone and without pioglitazone and what is the incidence of diabetic retinopathy and out of that diabetic retinopathy how many of them have macular edema and then after stoppage of pioglitazone after how many weeks to how many months can it be reversed also so something which we can do nationally also so these are some of the important points i think if ophthalmologist also reinforces the education part of it i think and then you can tell specifically like the way we are telling that you know this patient requires a specific retina specialist opinion not just ophthalmologist the similar way i think a ophthalmologist or a a retina specialist must tell their patient if they are not having a good control go to a diabetes specialist to have a good control of diabetes yeah i think you have made excellent points dr sabu actually in this workshop while we have been kind of focusing that the diabetologist and physician have to spare more time and talk about retinopathy or referral guidelines for them to us there is a reverse learning also which has to happen that is as ophthalmologists and retina specialists we also need to learn and actually counsel the patients for two more minutes as dr sabu has said and reinforce about their not just glucose level but even the other factors like lipid control or hypertension or nephropathy all those things will take additional 2 minutes so while we are asking the diabetologist and physician to give 2 minutes for fundus 
we should also spend two more minutes to talk about non retinopathy and reinforce their overall control and i See, what happens when patient goes to any specialist like suppose my patient who goes to a cardiologist or a nephrologist who had already developed the complication then that specialist because that is now the primary problem he is understanding that diabetes is a primary problem but now this is a major issue if the same specialist also talk about the importance of a good glycemic control it makes lot of difference you know if a ophthalmologist or a retina specialist again tells it is all because of your poor glycemic control and still it will further worsen if you will not keep a very good or tight glycemic control we know from science point of view that initially for a shorter period of time if we in, increase the tighter glycemic control probably it may worsen the retinopathy but only for a short period of time but But for a long period of time, these patients will ultimately get benefit, at least for further complication which are there, like retinopathy, along with retinopathy, nephropathy, and other complication. They all can be prevented, or at least the progression can be halted. So I mean, what I mean to say is that the specialist who is dealing with these complications, they also must reinforce the patient about the importance of a tighter glycemic control. They should also know what is A1C. what should be the avc every time when patient goes in next 6 months there is a visit or next 3 months you have a follow up visit with the patients you please see that what is your avc when it was done why you are not gone to your doctor why you are coming only here now the patient is just going on keeps on going to a ophthalmologist or retina specialist of last 2 years or one and half years for getting his treatment but he is completely forgotten his hmm. primary care physician or a diabetologist he had not gone there he had not seen his avc report so that should not happen i think that is very very important from uh, a consulting point of view from ophthalmic ophthalmic side very nice point dr sabu so like you have already made the differentiation in the sense uh, ophthalmologist versus retina specialist do you recommend a similar guideline let us say if a retina specialist has found diabetic retinopathy that means already microvascular complications have started and that patient is actually going to a primary care physician maybe once in 6 months they don't know what's happening is there a point where we need as retina specialist to now funnel these patients to a diabetologist should there no rather this is not possible because in india the number of diabetic patients are so high and primarily we want all primary care physician to treat diabetic patients but i will specifically say only for those patients who have developed some complications and now they require more tighter glycemic control because still initiation of insulin done in india by only 4000 or 5000 physicians and around 20000 physicians might be prescribing it as a follow up patients but you know we have 100000 physicians in india who are treating or primarily they are writing so type 2 diabetic patients are so number is so large even 50% of them are not getting treatment at this point of time as per in dab study so what i will recommend from rss day that all my primary care physician should be trained enough to write and prescribe the treatment and they should follow and that is what our rssdi guideline we had now gone to all districts of country all rural physician started using our rssdi guideline to treat the diabetic patients but our primary idea is at least they should also know when they should refer to specific diabetes specialty clinic so as a doctor as a ophthalmologist or as a retina specialist doctor at least you can tell that your diabetes required better control a good glycemic control will help you if your doctor who is doing a diabetes practice also is good enough but otherwise you can think of taking a, a consultation or a, a you know a, a one visit to a diabetes specialist doctor also for a better glycemic control but primarily on a as a blanket statement i don't want to make that each and every patient of diabetic should go to a diabetes specialist only what do you say sanjay you know i entirely agree with you because the wide population of people that we have it today uh it's it's physically impossible that you know everybody can touch base with a, quali- uh, a you know specialized diabetologist uh they have to and it's i mean majority of the work is done by the primary care physicians but you have to funnel them into a space and they develop complications so that they get better managed and uh, i think that's where dr bansi is coming from to say that if you do find that there are early you know indications of complications then you need to involve a tertiary care center who would handle the complications well who are trained to do so 
so that you know we can pre- slow down the complications or reverse the complications and not end up having you know advanced eye disease which can lead to blindness at a later point of time so i think our responsibility goes to all the patients with diabetes to see how effective treatment that we can give them so while you know giving them good glycemic control is been at the primary care physician level getting them to better goals and or complicated cases which are not achieving the goals and you know looking at complications probably may require a little more specialized help and that's where probably you need to make that differentiation yeah i think that those are excellent points that uh, have come out in fact just looking at this discussion i feel that maybe you know we should come out with a paper uh, at least the initial draft of what should be the guidelines the communication pattern the referral patterns uh, you know between diabetologists physicians and ophthalmologists uh, yeah, just to give you a reference raja that you know uh, what is happening is we are focusing so much from our specialized areas for example we talk about diabetes and hypertension and diabetes and lipids there are so the other aspects that we have not and recently we actually combined with the periodontal society to lay stress on diabetes and oral health and we have come out and published a paper together with the indian periodontal society uh, on diabetes and oral health and that has really gone all over the place where experts from both the societies actually got together and how can we train dentists about oral health and uh, that has made a huge impact and we are sort of rolling it out as a workshop too similarly i think you know our societies uh, vitreoretinal and ophthalmic and rssj can come up with you know uh, points for both the sides for the ophthalmologists as well as for uh, you know primary care and diabetologists how collaboratively we can work together to reduce the incidence of diabetic risk yeah thank you so much actually both uh, dr rajiv raman and dr padmaja rani are experts and they would you know they would be act- actually very keen to work on this kind of a paper and come up with common guidelines so actually i i can assure you that they both will do a definitely a good job and uh, come back to us with uh, guidelines so now in the interest of time i now request dr rajiv raman who again no need no introduction is a senior consultant at uh, shankar netral at chennai and a leading expert on diabetes retinopathy one of the most prolific researchers in any field in india uh, he will be talking to us on diabetic retinopathy management guidelines and awesome thank you dr raja uh, it's a real pleasure being in this meeting and thanks raja for this great initiative of rssdi at uh, aioc and uh, vrsi and next few minutes i'll be touching on diabetic retinopathy management and the referral guidelines which are there i'll be covering these things what is the current treatment of diabetic retinopathy what has changed in last decade and as a physician what's your role and there are some myths which many times i see which people have and i'll try to cover some of them so as dr padmaja rightly said the staging of diabetic retinopathy or classification is very very crucial because that determines whether you need to refer a patient or you can still manage the patient at your clinic and as we saw we have no diabetic retinopathy mild and moderate these three stages which are something where really uh, eye treatment or retina treatment is not required and then we have severe non proliferative proliferative and dme which are the sight threatening diabetic retinopathy which needs some intervention uh so if patient comes to you with these three uh, conditions still moderate npdr it's the control of risk factors and that is important especially to reduce the uh, the progression of the disease the a1c the blood pressure dyslipidemia you should rule out a macular edema because these are the cases who macular edema can present even in mild and moderate npdr so rule out macular edema and if there is no or mild non proliferative diabetic retinopathy we need to just have a yearly checkup and for a moderate non proliferative a six monthly follow up should be fine however if a patient has these conditions the severe non proliferative or a proliferative or diabetic macular edema these are referable diabetic retinopathy which needs treatment and the decision for further follow up would depend on what treatment the ophthalmologist is giving so it's usually either monthly follow up or three monthly depending on what treatment he does 
However, for an optimal response to each of these therapies, it may be a laser, maybe intravitreal injection, systemic control is the key. And now we are getting more and more evidence that even the response of anti-VEGF, the re response of steroids, they all have a relation. Systemic control has an important relation in them. The need for frequent injection may reduce if you have a good control. Currently, the treatment of diabetic macular edema is based on where the edema is. If it is involving the center part of the retina, anti-VEGF is the key uh, treatment. And if it is not involving the center, then laser still is the mainstay in managing diabetic macular edema. Sometimes, because as Dr. Padmaja has showed, a lot of multimodal imaging has come and because of OCT, sometimes we are able to make out that the edema is not because of exudation of fluid, but it's the pull of the retina, the tractional element, especially on doing a OCT. And these are the cases where just medical management or injections may not work. And these are the cases where surgery is required. Still, the management of proliferative diabetic retinopathy, the mainstay is laser. And this is a very old, oh, I, I'm not able to play the video. Let me see if I can. Video is not playing one minute. It's just a small clip of video showing the vitrectomy. You may want to uh, just yeah, it is just file probably or no no uh, okay. I'll not spend much time if I huh, I can see so uh, in so these cases where there is a traction or a bleed which is not resolving the vitrectomy definitely helps. And these are the cases we remove these traction, we remove this blood and the vision improves. So what has changed in last decade? Many things have changed in diabetic retinopathy. One is our understanding of the disease itself has changed. We now know that initially there is a neuronal damage. Always we have been seeing this vascular damage of microaneurysms, new vessels, bleed. But before onset of these, there are neuronal changes which happen in the retina and more and more we are realizing that there are inflammatory pathways also not only the angiogenic pathways which are there in diabetic retinopathy the diagnosis also the modalities have changed and coming even for screening now we have a lot of these handled portable smartphone devices which are there which are pretty good there are a lot of evidence now, even recently, there has been a meta-analysis trying to look at efficacy. This seems to be good in detecting sight-threatening diabetic retinopathy. For early stages of DR, like mild, sometimes it may miss, but it is good to detect the late stages of diabetic retinopathy. There are a lot of these portable, economical, non-midriatic fundus cameras which are there in the market. And in the chat box, Dr. Padmaja has given some of the names. All these are pretty good as far as screening for diabetic retinopathy is concerned. As an ophthalmologist, we have many other tools. We, as she has told, we have the angiograms, the OCT angiograms, the uh, OCT itself, which does help us in managing our patients in a better way. One thing which has definitely changed because of the way we treat diabetic retinopathy, the need for a more frequent visit to ophthalmologist. Because the problem is many of these are treated with intravitreal injections of anti-VEGF and the effect of these injection lasts only for about a month. Some of them, it lasts for about two months. And the patients with diabetic macular edema, they need nearly about four to five injections through their first year. And it's not only that, even in second and third year, they need injections. Their frequency may reduce, but that's the reason they come to us more frequent than they used to come before. Uh, coming to the role of physician, I would say is very, very crucial, both in treatment as well as in screening for retinopathy. As last talk, we have really seen that medical management is very important as far as diabetic retinopathy is concerned. It's the overall metabolic control, the glycemic control, blood pressure control, dyslipidemia, and also existing medical problems as so Dr. Agrawal rightly said the anemia and many other factors which are there, they all have influence on the outcome of diabetic macular edema and PDR. 
many times as an ophthalmologist, we do get an opinion from a physician more for a safety reason. And I'm sure you must have got many patients for fitness for angiogram. And this dye is excreted in renal tubules. So probably doing these renal functions. But now these patients have reduced because the number of angiograms has, uh, has really reduced with the onset of the, uh, with these newer OCT and OCTA. Sometimes the ophthalmologist sends you for a physician for, for, for the fitness for intravitreal anti-VEGF. The very reason being that uncontrolled BP, many of these anti-VEGFs, they increase the blood pressure. So uncontrolled blood pressure, definitely we don't need, want during injections. And they also increase the chance of a cerebral, a cerebrovascular accident. And so the current guidelines are that last three months, if there is uh, any CVA, the intravitreal injections are not given. Uh, the uh, another safety concern is a glycemic control before giving an injection. And as I was mentioning, they come to us every one month or every second month. And currently the guidelines from AIOS and VRSI is that at least we want the random blood sugar less than 200. I'm, these are not for the efficacy part because efficacy would like to have a good HbA1c, however, for safety concern, RBS is something which we all look into. Uh, for screening, definitely there are lots of options of screening and many of the physicians, they practice direct ophthalmoscopy. Indirect ophthalmoscopy, I don't think that many of the, ophthalmo the physicians practice, but fundus cameras, as was mentioned, many of the physicians have a fundus camera now. Important is that try to do a dilated ophthalmoscopy and dilate with tropicamide, avoid any phenylephrine in these cases because if there is a, a hypertension, it may increase. There are a couple of models for screening. I always say it can be a physician-led model or an ophthalmologist-led model. Physician-led model can be a dilated. So in the, the, not without the midriasis, if you're doing a direct ophthalmoscopy, it's like doing not doing it at all because you'll be missing majority of lesions. So a dilated direct ophthalmoscopy for all your diabetics or a non-midriatic fundus photography because these current non-midriatic cameras are uh, sufficient enough. They can capture a good quality 45 degree posterior pole images. Or it can be ophthalmologist led model, a screening where uh, ophthalmologist goes and does a screening or use cameras and do a teleophthalmology based uh, uh, screening or more commonly now a hybrid model, a camera at a physician clinic and grading done by the ophthalmologist. I think these are the three models which can uh, answer how we can actually reach to all our diabetics. Now coming to grading. So once the images are there and this question was uh, there that who will do the grading. So Dr. Padmaja has nicely initiated some of the training programs. There are a lot of training programs online to teach the technicians to grade diabetic retinopathy, especially referable versus non-referable. Physician himself can do it. Ophthalmologists are definitely there. And I'm talking about something which, is, which should be there at the physician clinic. The other one which is gaining more popularity now are many of these AI algorithms, which can diagnose diabetic retinopathy with a reasonable good accuracy. Uh, the currently available ones, if you look at literature, all of them have accuracy more than 95%, so it's pretty good. And recently, ADA has also given the guideline. They have introduced AI, that AI can be used for uh, screening or uh, grading diabetic retinopathy, anything more than mild and diabetic macular edema. However, they say that use FDA-approved device. The FDA-approved device currently is not available in India, but a lot of CE approved devices are there. Uh, they also go, go further uh, telling where you should not use AI. So patients who have already a retinopathy, like they are a known case of retinopathy, better to send to ophthalmologist rather than using AI for diagnosis. Those who had any prior retinopathy tr treatment, again, they are not the right candidates. And if they have symptoms of visual impairment, they have vision symptoms. AI is not the right tool to use. Definitely refer to ophthalmologist. This is just a small video to show how actually it works. So this is a Google 
uh, AI, you put the image, it starts analyzing the image and gives with uh, fair accuracy what stage of diabetic retinopathy it is and what grade of diabetic macular edema it is. Uh, coming to some myths. So one of the thing which is often say uh, physicians say that I don't do, a, uh, I do an undilated direct ophthalmoscopy because he may land up in an angle closure and no, that is one myth which many times we all have. You must understand that in general population, the chances of causing an angle closure is one in 20,000. And at risk population, the Chinese population or those who are these uh, no, Northeast uh, guys who have a little narrower eyes, there the angle closure rate is again less than 1%. Chinese population has maximum, it's about one in thousand, they have the risk of uh, angle closure. And I was trying to find a simile that one in 20,000, what is the risk? So odds of having an air travel accident in your lifetime is one in 20,000. So it's not very common, that's one. And secondly, definitely you should educate them. You don't want any one patient also to develop angle closure. So educate the patients regarding the symptoms of acute angle closure, that if after dilatation, if he feels that there is pain, red, redness, nausea, vomiting, definitely refer to ophthalmologist. And a simple test called as a von Herrick test with a, a torch light showing the shadow, we can see if you can grade it based on whether it is a narrower angle or not, or anything more than or uh, less than two grade, you definitely would not uh, want to dilate this, but all others can be very safely dilated. The second myth is that anything red, yellow, or white on the retina, I would prefer to refer my patients. As we have seen till moderate, you really don't need to refer these. And the referable retinopathy is basically these extensive hemorrhages in all four quadrants, venous abnormalities in multiple quadrants, that is the severe NPDR, and those who have these hard exudate, which are in the central retina, uh, or approaching, or if you find any new vessel, these are the cases which definitely needs a referral. Or these cases who have a vitreous hemorrhage, the pull on the retina, the tractional element, the proliferative retinopathy, these are the cases who definitely need a referral to ophthalmologist. One of the things which previously, a couple of years back, we used to, even we used to tell our patients that once you lose vision, hardly there is any improvement in whatever treatment we do, is just to maintain your vision. We don't want you to lose further, which is not true now because anti vegfs have shifted because of these injections. It has shifted from stabilization to improvement and more than 40% have actually more than three line improvement on this chart, which is really significant. And 80 to 90%, they don't lose further vision. So definitely anti vegfs have uh, shifted the thing from stabilization to improvement of vision in diabetic macular edema and our newer vitrectomy machines, the smaller gauge machines, they have given a very good success rate. We used to talk about uh, you know, 30, 40% to date, 80 to 90% of our vitre vitrectomy for diabetic uh, retinopathy, the proliferative diabetic retinopathy, we get good results. Uh, I'll go ahead with my next talk also, which is on planning, management, and evaluation of diabetic retinopathy screening program. So how to go about, so this is a very recent guideline, which all uh, the three, the All India Ophthalmological Society, the task force, which we have created, and the Vitro Retinal uh, Society of India, we came out with a consensus statement on how to do the screening for diabetic retinopathy in India. I would encourage all of you should read that because that will answer many of your questions. Some salient features of for planning a DR screening first is to collaborate with the ophthalmologist who can treat diabetic retinopathy because you want to close the loop. You don't want to just screen and keep these patients and you don't have anybody at the other end who will treat them. Select a retina camera. Any camera is fine. A minimum resolution of about six megapixel or 30 pixels per retinal degree is something which is recommended by AIOS. These are the, uh, any of, the, so currently available uh, fundus cameras, all of them are more than this. So you can use any one of that. You should identify a person who will take these retinal images and you need to train these people so that they take good quality retinal images. They should know how many fields, 
what area should be taken and select a grading plan. As I told you, either train the technician, you yourself get trained or have a AI or refer to ophthalmologist or have a system where you load the images and the ophthalmologist does a grading. Uh, select the grading plan and then establish a good referral and a recall system. It's very important because these patients who have retinopathy, it's not a one-time go, they need to come again for screening. And again, you don't want a person with no diabetic retinopathy to take an image on every visit. So you should have a good recall system, preferably if you have a EMR or a register so that you can make it sure that they get a repeat examination at an appropriate time. Home to screen, first visit to a, a physician, all type two diabetes and type one after five years of diagnosis because in the initial time, they don't develop retinopathy. And further evaluation is based on diabetic retinopathy status. One important thing is whenever you are shifting a patient from a oral hypoglycemic agent to insulin, or whenever you are having a strict control of, uh, or when you initiate your insulin, there is a rapid reduction of uh, HbA1c. And these cases, the, the severity of retinopathy sometimes increases. So it's good idea to screen them during that time. You can also do a high risk screening where you target people because as was mentioned in the last talk, the, the strongest predictor is the longer duration of diabetes. So especially people who have long duration of diabetes and if people have other microangiopathy, definitely tell them. The reverse is also true. So I always tell that if you have retinopathy, there's 80% chance that you may have some form of nephropathy. So definitely visit your uh, diabetologist or a physician. So um, Rajiv, just one quick clarification the previous yes. when on the, the top point which you mentioned. Uh, do you mean that all type 2 and type 1 should be screened after 5 years of diagnosis? No, no. no. Type 2 at the diagnosis, type 1 after 5 years of diagnosis. Correct. Thanks for the clarification. Yeah. Yeah. So which patients to refer? So you want to refer all the patients who have more than moderate non-proliferative retinopathy. Anything where you see those yellow dots on the central area, the macular edema. And more important because 30% of the images when you take a photograph by a non midriatic camera, nearly 30% of them are ungradable. You will not be able to see anything or a very poor quality image. That's because of cataract. Because if you take an image from a non midriatic sometimes in these cases, you dilate and take the image, still the image may become gradable. And we have shown in one of our study that non-gradability reduces from 30% to nearly about 5% if you use a non midriatic camera. But even if uh, after doing all these things, the image is not gradable, it's important to refer these patients because sometimes by dilating and doing an indirect ophthalmoscopy, we can still make out the lesions, we can treat these patients. So if you look at all three, the chunk of your patient majority would be ungradable patients who will be referred and more than non moderate and PDR and macular edema definitely needs a referral. How do you evaluate your DR screening services? So uh, it's good to look at, and these are again universal guidelines that DR screening programs should achieve at least 80% sensitivity, 95% specificity. Important is there should be less than 5% technical failure rates. The technical failure rates are usually because of the camera. And it's important that 10% of your, no subset of your images better to so when you're starting 10% of your normal images and preferably all images with DR should be reviewed by an ophthalmologist or a retina specialist regularly to ensure a quality check. The same is also true when you are using AI, at least 10% of these images, normal images, and even those all with DR images should be seen by an ophthalmologist colleague. Because today there are no legal frameworks as far as AI is concerned. So just to conclude, it's the collaborative work, the initial diagnosis and appropriate referral by a physician and a diagnosis management and a good referral back for systemic control by ophthalmologists. I think by doing these two, we would be providing the best care for diabetic retinopathy for our patients. Thank you very much. Any questions, I'll be happy to take.
Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Rajiv, for the excellent presentation. Again, going back to the first uh, points which uh, Dr. Banshi Sabu had made as to what they expect from us uh, is very simple. What should be done or the, what is the best modality for physicians and diabetologists to screen and when should they refer? In a nutshell, if you can just briefly describe that, that I think that would be useful for them. Uh, Rajiv, yeah. just briefly describe what is the one single way of, I mean, it may not be ideal or perfect, but mm -hmm. at this point of time, which is the best way to screen and which is the best acceptable referral point in the sense at what, what should they see and say, okay, now you have to go to the retina specialist. See, first thing is as far as the best way of screening, I would say that now the retinal cameras have really become cheap. They are, uh, so at one time it was costly. So I would still say that though directed, uh, direct ophthalmoscopy is still there, but the skill and even COVID times, you don't want to go to very near to the patient. I would say fundus cameras are the way and it's good to have these cameras at your clinic. That's number one. What, what, what was what do you think is the appropriate, appropriate, I mean, approximate cost of these new cheaper made in India fundus cameras? Made in India cameras are anywhere from two to three lakhs. I always feel it should come further because I think for a common physician, the costliest tool they have is a ECG machine probably, which is much less than that. And it should become a part of the diabetic evaluation when See, the problem is the diabetologists do, though, and physicians do get all the lab tests done. They get a lipid profile and they get, so this is something one stop, but here there is extra effort which is needed. But I think that would be something which will go a long way if you keep a retina a fundus camera. That's number one message. As far as referral, I would suggest that anything moderate, uh, more than moderate NPDR or I, to start with initially, if you have a doubt, better to refer even moderate. Because see, the important is even if you can rule out no DRs, 80% of the population is gone. 20% referral still is doable. But if you can go till moderate NPDR, that's also fine. I think the uh, grade, uh, da, even if you are not very comfortable grading, but if you have a camera which you can take good images and if image quality is bad, definitely you refer. Image quality is good. If you have lesions on the posterior pole and all those, if you can grade it very well. Otherwise, I would say you can still refer everything that would also reduce. Whom to refer? I would say refer to an ophthalmologist. Uh, at least, I would not say that send to a retina specialist everything because diabetic retinopathy now, many of the anterior segment people also are capable, at least they have OCT machines, they have some one step beyond. And if they need specialized care, they will definitely refer because we don't have so many retina specialists. So thank you so much that the, you have made some excellent points. Some need to be more crystallized in terms of what ophthalmologists can do and what retina specialists have to do. But I think those are excellent points you have made. In the interest of time, now I would like uh, Dr. Padmaja to come to the next stage, the interesting stage of quiz and feedback. Uh, let us uh, revise some of the things that happened in this workshop uh, in terms of uh, screening and uh, referral guidelines. So I can actually see the response in the form of chat box I can see. So do you refer this patient? If so, if you think uh, yes, why? One can write in the chat box. So both are uh, of the same patient. One yeah. the right the same patient. Side. So would you refer this patient to an ophthalmologist or retina specialist? Yes, very good. Great. So why? So we will actually, whenever we see a fundus photograph, so it's important that uh, 
there can be an a model but it is also important that the person who is capturing the photograph as well as the person who is actually seeing the photograph should be able to classify so we need to classify in basis of on the macular area and also in the diabetic retinopathy so very good so someone said that the right eye diabetic macular edema and left eye is vitreous hemorrhage so that is correct so when we say uh, macular edema one can also classify further because we re, uh, we discussed that a mild dme means the hard exudates or whatever the yellow dots will be away from the foveal center whereas here they are approaching the foveal center so this is a moderate macular edema this is a referable condition similarly the patient has a vitreous hemorrhage very good please grade this image so we classified diabetic retinopathy as normal mild uh, moderate severe pdr and dme as mild moderate and severe so grade this image so this comes with a responsibility so when we are having a diabetic retinopathy uh, classification extending to the both allied and physicians and across the specialties so a, an image has to be specifically looked into whether there are any red dots like microneurisms whether there are hemorrhages whether there is any uh, yellow lesions like autumnal spots or hard exudates so what do you think so is the uh, everyone is i think ah very good so someone said that it is normal yes and one need to understand that sometimes what you see in a normal patient they always don't forget the disc as well as the disc is also should be normal so just we have attended diabetic retinopathy workshop and we learn to grade also but we should not forget the disc disc also should be normal and what you see this reflex like yellow thing is actually the nerve fiber reflex which is actually normal please grade the image below so this is a white field fundus photography and uh, i think one important uh, prerequisites for diabetic retinopathy grading is actually single posterior pole fundus photograph is also enough but if you have a, a wide field fundus photography you can accurately mention but that is not a prerequisite because 90% of your diabetic retinopathy lesions will occur in this posterior pole alone and uh, whenever you see a fundus photography you have to grade in two ways one is what is the diabetic retinopathy is it mild moderate or severe and what is the macular edema so you have to give the, your answer will have two components one is about diabetic retinopathy classification and one about dme classification so when we discuss diabetic retinopathy we said that there are there has to be some lesions like hemorrhages in all four quadrants then it will say, will say severe npdr and when you have hard exudates and all when are approaching the macula then we say it is like a diabetic macular edema which could be moderate so anyone answers so if you see here the hemorrhages if you carefully see they are actually in all quadrants yes so severe npdr is correct and about diabetic macular edema do you think it is mild moderate or severe moderate dme so already someone has answered it is a moderate dme so the answer is severe npdr with moderate dme as rajiv already said that anything with uh, moderate or severe uh, npdr we need to refer yes please grade this image so whenever we need to understand that when you for a screening most of uh, like only 20% of our diabetic patients will have some form of diabetic retinopathy so that means around 10% only will have that severe sight threatening diabetic retinopathy which can be easily uh, you know uh, gradable but we need to look at yes so someone clearly said that it is a mild npdr because one need to really look for those red dots where are they you know one need to clear look there are some yellow dots also one or one or two like small uh, is like so this is a, actually a mild uh, npdr very good i am sure many people will tell immediately this uh, grading so if you see it's a 45 degrees fundus photography you are seeing lesions uh, like a hemorrhages when you see this uh, in all quadrants and you are having a hard exudate so tell the classification of what is diabetic retinopathy classification and what is the center macular macular uh, maculopathy classification
severe macular edema, correct? Yes. Someone, uh, Prasan Lakshmi, she told very clearly, severe NPDR with severe DME, that is the correct diagnosis. So you are having hemorrhages in all quadrants and you are having heart exudates which are involving the foveal center. So this is a severe uh, diabetic macular edema. Very good. So we discussed, uh, what is the classification? Please grade the image. Very good. So when we say proliferative diabetic retinopathy, we need to, yes, correct answer is high risk PDR because it is not only having a vitreous hemorrhage, but a, a pre retinal hemorrhage and proliferative hemorrhage. And don't forget about the macula. What do you think? Here, there is some amount of macula is also seen. What do you think about the macular uh, uh, status? So it's a severe DME is also involved. So there is a, some amount of mac heart exudates which are involving the foveal center along with the this thing. So you can say this is PDR with HRC with severe DME. Please grade the image below. So what are these? So until now, we discussed in the workshop about red dots, yellow dots, and flowers. So there are some black uh, scars are seen, which are nothing but the post laser. So very good post PHC PDR, or we say lasered proliferative diabetic retinopathy. And here it is quite stable. You are not seeing any fresh hemorrhage. You can see the new vessels, which are also became the flower size actually become white because of the laser. It is a kind of a stable. Uh, so it's a lasered PDR. Very good. Now, please grade the image. So we discussed initially, yes, mild means only few uh, changes. But uh, as I said, a, a microneurism can be detected by a sarcinate uh, like accidents. But here you are seeing more than uh, mild NPDR, just not only microneurism, but you are also seeing hard accidents. So this is the classification is moderate NPDR. Very good. So can you grade the image? And if not, why? Is it an image which you can grade for diabetic retinopathy? So we use a term called gradable or not gradable. So it's not, it's not gradable. And it is because there is a presence of a LOI structure and everything. These are nothing but the asteroid hyalosis. One important referral guideline is any ungradable image or the visual acuity which is less than 612 and is not improving with whatever and you are not able to explainable by whether the fundus feature even looks normal. These are all, all non-gradable images needs referral. So it's non-gradable due to presence of asteroid hyalosis. Okay. Please look at carefully at this image. Do you find any finding? I'm only asking about finding. Do you see any finding? Now? Yes. So someone said NVD. Yes. So what I want to stress upon fact is that this fundus image, uh, when we say new vessels, uh, the subtle stages, the subtle new vascularization requires carefully look at it. So you can see that the new vessels will be always like fibrillary, they'll be like a tangly mesh. And of course, with the advent of octa kind of investigations in the clinic, of course, we can determine even the extent and depth also. But on a fundus photograph, one need to carefully look into those uh, clinical findings, both on the disc as well as elsewhere. Very good. So any, any here also, please describe the finding, if at all you find any important finding that will require for the grading. Now. So here, if you see, there are hemorrhages in all uh, four quadrants. And, uh, and there are some hard exudates which are even approaching the macula. So we know that this patient will require referral. But however, Yes, NVE plus NVD. Very good. Excellent. I think you have scanner like eyes, Dr. Sheikh Shoni Sultana. So you have a uh, both. So within uh, 
the uh, 45 degree field we say nvd with the you have a neoascularization and also you are also having a another flower and the neoascularization elsewhere so this is a proliferative diabetic retinopathy which requires referral so this i think we already had this uh, picture uh, in my talk just to again uh, check up on so what is the condition that we are seeing so a b scan done yes very good asteroid hyalosis so what is the can you please guide the, uh, grade this image very good so the job is very easy pdr with high risk characteristics you are not only having a tractional band nvd and also vitreous hemorrhage very good what is this so you can understand that just be hearing one hour or one hour orientation also we can easily grade and we can even train the technicians who are helping with us also we can train them in this classification so that it can be a coordinated model yes high risk pdr with tdr and you can see when you do an angiography just for the sake not necessary that we do angiography for thing but in ffa you can uh, see that the new vessels actually leak profusely so one can easily know so this is a pdr with high risk characteristics mm -hmm. this is the last scan can you grade this and don't forget the disc always see that the disc is here is very normal pink neuroretinal rim cup disc margins so don't forget about the disc because one can have a glaucomatous disc like a cupping it could be a pale disc due to any ischemic optic nerve again that needs a referral yes and moderate npdr you are telling and please also classify the macular area also so whenever you see a fundus photography please grade for diabetic retinopathy as well as the macular status so is the macular status do you think it is a mild dme are a moderate dme or severe dme so whenever we say mild dme the hard exits will be away from the foveal center if it is a moderate it will be approaching the foveal center so very good answer is moderate npdr with correct answer is moderate diabetic macular edema so now comes with uh, there is one online certification program i would all of you to uh, go through that and this will give you a uh good expertise in uh, doing whatever this kind of orientation workshop it will be a, like a revision as well as understanding the concepts and internalizing it will take around 5 to 6 hours of your time and the registration is free and uh, this is done by the university of melbourne and you will get an online certification course and this is a good course to do as a even if you are a physician and ophthalmologist you should do yourself because you need to train your team also to do this diabetic retinopathy certification because in a set, because whatever the technology a technology anything comes ultimately the human element which is there should also know what they are dealing with so this uh, certificate course is, uh, is uh, the registration is free and you can do any number of attempts and the passing this examination will give you kind of a certification and also understanding how to grade screen and referral guidelines for the diabetic retinopathy so i would like to leave with the example of uh, dr nazi alamuddin he was an endocrinologist from uh, us he spent uh, one one week uh, mm, short observership with us in alvi prasad institute and then he actually finished the certification after the orientation to the diabetic retinopathy screening guidelines and he is aim is now to start an diabetic retinopathy screening integrated one stop diabetes eye care model at bahrain so ultimately i would like to end with a statement that the integrated models the physician and ophthalmologist combined models to prevent diabetic retinopathy blindness so that all may see thank you very much so i will uh, also put in the chat box the link for the course thank you and uh, mo uh, and uh, this is the post assessment so many of you uh, we have actually given a pre assessment form this post assessment form i would like all of you to uh, go through that because all the panelists uh, have touched upon the topics that are related to post assessment and once you do this post assessment form you will also get the answers for the questions and uh, this is uh, also to have a um, knowledge of whatever that uh, you have under uh, underwent in this workshop 
so please access this form and we'll also be sending as a mailer for you also as in the workshop and i'll also be putting in the chat box this link thank you thank you padmaja so much for the excellent uh, conduct of this workshop right from the classification pathogenesis to the end of the quiz and assessment forms uh, i think in the interest of time i think we will not be able to take any more questions here but i think overall uh, the workshop we saw in the quiz many people were answering correctly i am assuming most of them are ophthalmologists i would be elated if diabetologists are able to diagnose like this uh, but I overall what the objective is like, uh, you know keep it simple for even diabetologist physician with the basic camera and when to refer maybe two points is what we need to keep on emphasizing again and again so that we are able to pick up patients who may be at risk uh, dr shobhit chawla uh, are you there would you like to give any closing remarks on this workshop yeah so Uh, basically uh, it was uh, on the initiative of uh, rssdi and aios that we had this workshop which has been uh, a great program to start off with you know what are the questions from the physicians and diabetologists side i would like to specifically thank dr padmaja and dr rajiv raman for actually taking interest and also doing their actually hard work Uh, for this uh, workshop we hope to do more such workshops in joint collaboration and this would also lead to certification uh, so that there is a standardized training process all across india thank you so much and we will come back to you with future courses have a good day thank you thank you thank you rajak goodbye